Hi, I'm Jeff. This is Tropical Plants at 53 degrees north. Now, today I thought we'd take a look at my Streptocarpus plants and discuss why they make such fantastic house plants. Now, obviously, I'm growing them in a greenhouse, but I've created the kind of conditions that you too can create in your house. And what we'll do is we'll go through all my different varieties and name them and look at the various care needs of Streptocarpus. And hopefully, you too will be able to buy a few plants and have a fantastic display indoors in your house. So let's jump in. And we are in. So why do I grow Streptocarpus? Well, first of all, Streptocarpus are Jesneriads. And if you've seen my video on Jesneriads, we've got a couple of other Jesneriads over here. I'll just show you those. So we've got the Caleria. Now don't forget, this isn't a Streptocarpus. It's in the Jesneriaceae family, but it's worth looking at. A few of the blooms just dropped off, but it's got some more coming up here. Beautiful plant. And I've got another Jesneriad here. This one is Caleria Brazil Gem. And that's just probably at its best at the moment. Absolutely spectacular colour. So if you're into Jesneriads, there's a couple of Caleria which are worth growing. But we're talking about another Jesneriad today. We're talking about the Streptocarpus. So I will go through all my Streptocarpus in a second. So they come from the woodlands and valleys of South Africa. So that gives you an idea of the kind of growth requirements that they have. And all of mine are from Dibleys, who are a, a, a well-known grower of Jesneriads in the UK. I think they're from Wales actually. Um, I'll have to check on that. So why do they make such such fantastic perfect house plants really well suited to growing indoors? Well a lot of the conditions are very similar and it's certainly in the UK anyway it's easy to create those conditions in the UK and, and even in a greenhouse in fact. So they're very easy in those terms. I always kind of raise an eyebrow when people talk about plants that are easy it's only easy if it's easy for you to create the conditions and I think Streptocarpus are one of those that if you have a similar climate to mine then it's pretty easy to create those conditions which we'll go through in a moment. I have got other videos on Streptocarpus which I'll point to and mention at various times as it crops up. I'm not going to go into massive detail if I've done another video on it already. So they have a really long flowering period uh, mine have been in flower from March and most of them go right the way through till December. I know you'll see various sources claiming that they stop in October, but as I say, mine, most of mine went through to December. I have got a so-called like perennially flowering Streptocarpus, one of the crystallized varieties, but I find that even that does actually prefer like a rest at some point over winter, but we'll come to that in a moment. There's an absolutely massive range of colours, many, many cultivars, and even flower size as well. That, that does range quite a lot. So again, I'll show you some of my varieties and some of the new ones that I've got. So I think what we'll do first of all, we'll just go through and name some of my varieties. I'll start over here on the left. So this purple and white one is Titania and I know when that's looking at its best there's one or two flowers beginning to go over now but when it's looking at its best I think that's one of my favorites actually I think a lot of them are my favorites depending on when they're looking their best there are one or two again like the crystal ice that when it's not in full bloom you just don't get the same effect when the whole thing is blooming it does look really spectacular and this one I found Titania I found was one that was pretty tricky to propagate and the di different ones of the varieties that I've got, um, depending on which one it is, like Pink Layla, for example, which I'll show you in a second, is a really easy one to propagate. I mean, they're all pretty easy. And I'll stick a couple of cards up to show you the various methods that I've tried and which method I preferred. They will propagate extremely easily, but depending on which cultivar you use, some are more successful than others. So that's Titania. So we'll move along here on this purple one. You'll notice that they are colour changes as well. Like the, the new blooms there you can see are much darker than the older blooms. This is all on the same plant. When they begin to go older, they tend to go paler in that one, on this particular variety anyway. 
So this one is, if I'm not mistaken, Katie, that one will be. Uh, moving along to one of the Crystal Ice varieties. This one's a bit slower coming into bloom. This one only tends to come into bloom like June time for me anyway. This is actually one of the varieties which is supposed to be in flower all year round. But like I said before, I found that when it comes round to December, they're looking pretty tired and it's well worth cleaning them up. I've got a video on the clean up. Again, I'll put a card up on what you do. Uh, I've demonstrated it. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, oh, there's another crystal ice variety at the back there and you can see it's a good time to point out that when they do drop the flowers don't just kind of leave them like that because they will introduce rots and funguses into the leaves so again there's crystal ice variety at the back we've got another one of the katie here there's a couple of plants there a couple of katies you know, just move along here this one is polka dot purple again it looks fantastic when it's just beginning to come into full bloom this one looking a bit tired now one or two of its blooms are going on which i will keep cutting off um, i just cut each bloom off i mean they will drop themselves but they leave like a well there you go that's what they leave one of these which will especially if it's been pollinated it will just go longer and longer um, so you're better snipping that off just there and then when the whole flower spikes finished prune it off as low as you possibly can in the pl on the plant now because some of these are tricky to get to i do tend to leave a little bit on and when it comes around to the cleanup in winter time you'll you'll need that spike in order to pull like the rosette off again i've done a video on that which i'll put a card up and point to at some some point it's worth looking at the leaves on here again the leaves are beginning to go quite pale green i mean i use the sticks the feeding sticks that you can buy online that last about three months you want something that's quite high potash something like a tomato, a tomato feed will do and you will feed them right the way through the year when they are flowering obviously again when they're not flowering you would lower the watering and reduce the fertilizing uh, like you would do with many plants so that's polka dot purple another titania there move along this one's looking really good this is on its second flush now this one is bethan so what you find that they will do they'll have that first flush in like late march april time and all the blooms will look spectacular and one by one they'll begin to fade and then you'll find that the plant will completely rid itself of, of blooms but you're literally talking for a couple of weeks and then up they all pop again and you've got another lot and they just keep cycling through that throughout the season this is a lovely one bethan that one's very easy to propagate so i'll just move you across to some of my others so what have we got up here so this is one that was just in a little bit of a rest period so this one is pink layla and this one had tons and tons of blooms all the blooms faded dropped off cut the flower spikes back and here it comes up again with its new blooms this has probably been without blooms for about a week and i expect these to be out again in a few days pink layla exactly the same there's pink layla in its full full blooming glory there. that's a really this is a really easy one to propagate as well and what i tend to favor is taking a whole leaf and chopping it down the middle either side of the rib you actually get rid of the rib strangely and you can then cut it into sections again i've got a video on how to do that you don't need any special com uh, compost or any special hormone rooting powder it just does it itself now would be a good time to do it but use a young leaf don't use one of the older leaves but again i'll just keep dropping in various tips as we work our way through so that's pink layla um, i've got a couple of my new varieties harlequin varieties i want to say something about those in a minute uh, we've got over here here is one of the crystal ice varieties and you can see when you've got loads of them this one looks really good when it's when it's quite sporadic when it's only just coming this one i'm not that thrilled with it uh, at the moment that one's looking really nice and again you can see what happens to the blooms so don't just leave them on the plant take them off cut it back and it will keep coming for you 
Uh, down here, again, I've got a couple of the pink Layla and another Titania. Um, so yeah, I was talking about the Harlequin varieties. I bought these Harlequin varieties from Dibley's quite early on, probably about February time. And these ones have been quite slow to bloom. I mean, what we're in now, early August now, um, this one is the first one that's produced a flower spike. So I'm looking forward to those, but they've taken longer than I anticipated. And there's another couple there, another couple of Harlequin varieties. Um, since then, I've actually bought some of the Demetris, um, Demetris varieties. And I'll show you some of those. They are looking really nice. So this is Streptocarpus DS Caramel. Same plant, and you can see it's slightly different blooms, coloured blooms on it. Only very small, only a new plant. This is one of those plants that seems to want to produce bloom before leaves. This one is Aramis. Again, I can't wait till these get to the same size as the my established ones. I've had these a few years now, and these are in quite large pots. We'll talk about potting in a little while. Um, over here, we've also got another Demetrius one, Kalahari. A lovely flower, lovely bloom, nice large flowered uh, streptocarpus there. <laughs> but yeah, it's only got one leaf. Uh, so once that's gone, hopefully that will come back again, which I'm sure it will. So let's just have a little chat about some of its care needs. Okay, so I'm looking down on polka dot purple and Bethan here. So light, well, of course, Streptocarpus love lots of light, but not direct sunlight. So the, I think the the general advice is like east or west window sill, but I mean, I tend not to go for uh, compass points. I think wherever in your house, because that's what I'm going to try and relate it to, because the title of the video is about growing them as house plants. So if you're growing it in your house, and I've grown some of these in the house as well quite successfully, what I found was you can actually put them in a place that's too dark. However, having said that, they will still bloom, just not as quickly. So, for example, down here, I've got some of my varieties that are quite shaded down there. Um, you've seen these varieties before. These are just some that I've took from as cuttings. And you can see some of those, they're only just coming into bloom. They are smaller ones because they were cuttings at the beginning or late end of last year and beginning of this year, but they took longer to bloom. Only about a month, but they took longer to bloom because they are in a shadier spot. So you can get away with it. I know what it's like trying to grow plants as house plants. It's very often a case of where it will go and where you can find somewhere to, to put it. They're very accommodating. It's just that if you put them in too shady a spot, they won't flower quite as quickly or maybe quite as prolifically, but they will still bloom. So that's one reason why they're very versatile. The only thing they will not stand is to be in full sun and they will wilt whether they have been watered or not. They will wilt if they are in full sun. Think about where they grow in South Africa, in the woodlands, in the shaded ravines, uh, near water. They don't want to be in the full sun, they don't like it. So try and make it as bright as you possibly can without being behind that full sun. Having said that, I have mine over here on the sunny side of the greenhouse. And we can see the sun popping through there, but it's well shaded. I've got at least... 85% shade cloth on that side so it gets quite hot over here but they don't mind that it's just that direct sunshine that they don't like so as far as watering goes you would expect them to be the kind of plant that wants to be wet all the time well they don't you really they really prefer to be kept on the drier side now that doesn't mean that you leave them until they are wilting they will wilt and they will recover uh, the best thing to do is just to keep kind of putting your finger in and lifting the pot and if it's very light or if they if they feel quite dry then give them some water it doesn't have to be absolutely tons of water that runs right through it they're the kind of plant that a little bit of water just keeps them going so i just do that on a daily basis i'll come in i mean obviously i've got a lot of plants here and i'll just lift the pot up or i'll stick my fingers in uh, or if I can detect that there's any kind of wilt in the leaf, what I tend to do is just kind of feel the leaf with my fingers. And if I can, I've got to know that if it feels in the very slightest loss of turgidity, 
then I, I know that it's ready for a little bit of water on top. What you don't want to do is be constantly trickling that water in and keeping them wet or keeping them sitting in water. They don't like that. I've got them in these trays, these gravel trays, and I've got to know that if the water's coming through the bottom and they are sitting in that water for any length of time, then they will wilt just as easily as they'll wilt if they're lacking water. So I would say keep them on the dry side, but keep watering when those conditions that I've just mentioned are met. Okay, as for, fer as for fertilizing, so they will want fertilizing on a weekly basis. The advice is to give them high potash or like a tomato feed, anything that's high in potash and to feed them once a week. Well, I've got enough feeding going on in the greenhouse, so what I tend to do is use those fertilizer, those feeding sticks that you buy online and I stick a stick inside. I do it pretty much straight away, unless it's been repotted. I mean, most of these were repotted in, I think it was December time. I mean, the advice is to repot them in early spring but in my case I do it when I think I've got time to do it which is usually over winter time and they've not suffered too much from that so I potted mine in about December time and they've been fine ever since once they start growing then I would normally wait about six weeks and then put some fertilizer in the pot I want to do something that I then don't have to keep coming back to so I use these fertilization general purpose feed sticks that last about three months most of mine now have actually had the sticks in it's coming up to about three months so i'm thinking that pretty soon they will need feeding and the indications for that are like for example this one you can see how the leaves are beginning to lose some of that really strong green that they had earlier on they're not all fading but there are one or two like i think this one's probably the worst one this polka dot purple you can see like a reddening around the edges and some of the leaves are beginning to go yellow so while we're talking about leaves they do lose leaves naturally and you can see what happens here see how this leaf has gone like a, a, a reddy brown at the end well all i would do with that is cut it off the they do that naturally they lose the end of the leaves naturally you find with most evergreen plants that's what happens but in this case it's so easy with streptocarpus if the leaf gets in the way or it's too big or if it, if it comes like that then just simply cut it off at the end or snap it off and it doesn't really suffer much from it it just tidies it up it means that you're not looking at a plant that's a plant that is all leaf because these leaves do get very very big so don't worry about just chopping them back at all it's absolutely fine they don't mind that at all yeah so we said you need to feed them all through the flowering season um, obviously in winter you're going to keep them more on the drier side and I have got a video about the winter cur which I'll stick a card up about that so pests well mine have suffered from pests uh, I'll tell you the kind of pests that you will get so one of the main ones is is the green fly. One of the unusual things about green fly with this is that it's the flowers and the flower stems that they prefer. You won't find any green fly on the leaves. The slugs, well you might see slug trails on the leaves, but they don't actually eat anything. They just don't like it, so that's one good bit of news. But if the green fly get at them, they definitely do like the flowers. They like to get inside the, the blooms at the top of the or sorry in the center there and you'll find well you'll you'll soon notice it because they spread very very quickly and you'll see all the little white exoskeletons that have been shed and they will go right the way along the the stems especially the tops of the stems pretty easy to get rid of i mean i tend to use either a, a contact insecticide i have used systemics in the past but i find that especially with streptocarpus they do mutate quite easily if you use systemics so you'll find like really odd leaves that are all growing stuck together or some oddly shaped blooms uh, but whatever your preferred method is of getting rid of green fly and aphids then by all means use that uh, another pest that they get especially if they're grown quite low to the ground like these ones down here is vine weevil and again i've got a video for how to get rid of vine weevil it's pretty easy again but you'll the problem with vine weevil is that by the time you notice you've got it it's too late the little grubs have eaten away all the roots so the best thing to do is to not let them 
get there in the first place. However, if you're growing yours indoors as a house plant, the problem of vine weevil is probably very, very low, so I wouldn't worry about that. But you can sort it, and the, the great thing about streptocarpus is that because they root so easily, even if you even if the grubs eat all the roots away you'll find that you can still rescue the plant so if you've got a plant with absolutely no roots whatsoever you can just propagate it in one of the methods that i've got in my other videos and you'll find that you don't lose it it's absolutely fine you can recover that plant and probably even make yourself some more plants like i've done down here to give away as gifts or just to increase your stock and one of the other pests is, strangely enough, the tarsonomid mite, uh, also known as the cyclamen mite. Now, I did have a real big attack of the cyclamen mite. I know Dibleys don't actually use any chemical controls. They use organic controls, which means that when your plants come, they may well have the tarsonomid mite already on it. And I'm thinking that's possibly what happened with mine. So I'll just show you something over here. Now over on one of my new harlequin varieties, you can just see there in the centre, see how it's dying off in the middle of the leaf, like towards the rib of the leaf? Well that is usually a good indication that this plant has cyclamen mite. And I might be able to show you some other damage somewhere. I did actually manage to eradicate this pest by using the systemics. Um, but you can see again, there's like damage in the middle of the leaf. What you'll find is if you go right down to the bottom, the base of the leaf, that tends to be the main area where the damage starts from this little mite. And then further up the leaf will start to brown and go yellow. But it's always towards the centre of the leaf. And I had a real bad attack of these. Um, one of the main problems with this mite is that when plants are touching what it does is it crawls from one plant to another it doesn't just affect cyclamen obviously it actually affects any house plant or most house plants probably not any but most house plants um, but unfortunately when you've got a display like i've got here it's pretty impossible at this stage of the year to avoid having plants touching they're just so packed in here that they are going to touch However, having said that, I do seem to have ridded myself of them for the time being, but I expect later on in the season I might have to deal with that again. And really, I don't see any way of getting rid of them other than by spraying with a systemic. The plants will survive, but as I said earlier, they may well get some mutations. So if anybody's had any experience of using organic methods, I would love to know uh, what they use. Okay, so as far as potting on, well, Streptocarpus do like to be potted on. These ones have been potted on a few times and they're in probably about 12 centimetre pot now, about 12 centimetre diameter. They will need potting every year and I will, I pot mine up a little bit, not a great deal, but by potting them up, then you know that they are taking advantage of that fresh compost. They do like to have fresh compost every year or so. I may, I may leave them a couple of years, we'll see. I don't think two years is that much different from one year, but I certainly wouldn't leave it any longer than that. They do like that refreshing of the compost. As far as potting up goes, it's simply a case of once you've cleaned them up for the winter, you would remove them from that pot and simply put them in a bigger pot with, with the fresh compost. Don't disturb the root ball if you can help it. Uh, as far as potting mix goes, well, the general advice is, and what these are all actually in, is a peat compost mixed with perlite. That's the general advice. However, I've seen the results of some trials where people have used various different composts, and honestly, I couldn't see the difference between any of them. The results of the trial were that they'll grow in pretty much anything. So I would wonder whether in the future it may be worth trying some kind of a peat free compost they will grow in multi-purpose compost and perlite and um, but i'm wondering whether to try a uh, coir or some other like more sustainable compost because i'm getting to that stage now where i'm really reading quite a lot which is negative in terms of using peat free compost because it's not sustainable and you are raiding like a real natural resource or a natural habitat so even though i've got lots of plants here in in a peat compost 
it's actually actually sphagnum peat moss that I'll miner in um, and they do grow well in it but I, I think I might just try a general purpose or a peat free one next time as far as temperatures go well because you're going to be growing them in a house and well I, I keep my greenhouse at a minimum of 12 they will go down to 10 they'll probably go down a little bit lower than 10 degrees celsius but as a general rule we will say about 12 to about 26 um, that's what's that 50 to about 80 degrees fahrenheit but what i would say is they will go lower and they will go higher so they're optimal temperatures not going to be a problem is it in a house i mean in here i've had this greenhouse even the other day it went up to 36 degrees fahrenheit uh, sorry 36 degrees celsius i did my absolute best to bring the temperature down again but they've not suffered too much from it so they are quite accommodating where it comes to temperature so in your house um, i would say anywhere where they're away from a radiator pretty much no plant like to be right next to a radiator so I try and keep them away from that if you can and if you've got them in a conservatory and it's going quite cold and on my conservatory goes down to about five degrees celsius in winter well that's not going to be ideal but they will survive as long as you don't let them get frosted they should be okay um, and again in a conservatory be careful that they're not in the sun when mine were in the sun even when they're in the sun for an hour a day that was too much they don't like to be in the sun at all so you need to keep them away from that okay so i think we've covered everything there so definitely worth trying as a house plant or even as a greenhouse plant if you can create those conditions um, i really really love streptocarpus they're so easy for me in the conditions that i've got and I'm really looking forward to some of these other varieties coming. I'm very much looking forward to the Harlequin varieties arriving. And these Demetrius varieties are absolutely spectacular, even as tiny little plug plants like this. And when they grow to the size that some of my other more mature plants are looking like at the moment, then they will really, really pack a punch, won't they? So if you've not given Streptocarpus a go, the world is your oyster. Get on to dibbles or get on to what the Demetrius website uh, I know in our case I think that's a Ukrainian company and in our case there's a, a couple of growers in the UK that somehow get their hands on these and they sell them as plug plants you can get them off eBay as well the Demetrius ones so I would definitely recommend giving it a go if you haven't already very very rewarding plants and extremely floriferous um, I would very much like to hear from people who grow these and what their experiences are of looking after them and I think that will do for today so I hope you enjoyed this video thumbs up if you did uh, maybe even try giving it a share who knows um, you might be able to help somebody else along the way so I hope you enjoyed it and for now I will see you on the next one bye